Welcome to the podcast, wherever you're listening from. Hope you're having a great day, a great week. Listen, it is good to be alive right now. I don't know if you know this, but what God is doing in the earth right now is unprecedented. You have been born into one of the greatest times in all of history. God is moving in profound ways all across the earth. Just the statistics of salvations that are happening around the world are amazing. So whatever's happened in your life, it's great to have you with us on the podcast. Here's something I've talked about before when I talk about the concept that church is a family. But a point that I bring up in that is this. How you view something or what you believe about it determines how you're going to engage with it or interact with it. How you view something determines how you're going to engage and interact with it. In other words, what I believe about something then is kind of the determining factor of how I'm going to engage with it. I mean, the example would be uh, the difference between how I engage with a puppy and a snake. You know, like we, we, we view puppies as cuddly and cute and nice and not dangerous at all, not a threat at all. And so because that's how I perceive and view a puppy, when a puppy comes into my life, I get on the ground and I let him lick my face and I pick him up and I cuddle with him. But I don't view a snake the same way I view a puppy. And how I view that snake which is a potential danger and not cuddly and not cute. And I, I'm not getting on the ground and cuddling with the snake and letting it lick my face. And, and I know that may be a little bit of a silly example, but how I view something determines how I'm going to interact and engage with it. I view a puppy a certain way, and so I engage with it a certain way. I view a snake a certain way, so I engage with it a certain way. Here's why I'm telling you this. The devil comes to distort your view of things that matter. There are foundational truths in your life that you must see properly because if you see them properly, you will engage properly with that truth or that situation. And if it's distorted... This is what the devil did in the garden. He just distorted Eve's view of God slightly. Does, does God really want you to thrive? God's kind of hiding things. God's holding back. And he, he just he distorted her view of God enough to where she interacted improperly and wrongly with it. And so the devil comes to distort our view on things that matters. And he's lying to us. We know this. The Bible says that he's the father of lies. One translation says it's his native language. And here's, here's two lies. I've talked about two lies in the podcast before, but let me tell you maybe the big lie that the devil is trying to feed you and that he's trying to distort two things that you view. I'll just break it down to this. The devil is trying to, to lie to you, or he's trying to distort your view of who God is as a father, and he's trying to distort your view of how God sees you as his child. So he's trying to distort how you see God as a father, and he's trying to distort how you believe God sees you as his child. Now, we're going to go through this, and we're going to walk through this a little bit, but, but I actually believe that almost all of our problems are actually connected to one of those two lies, that, that if we're not thriving in an area, if there's a problem in an area, if we're stumbling in some area, if, if, if it's not abundant life but bondage, there is a lie we're believing, and we have allowed the enemy to distort our view of who God is as a father or what we believe God as a father thinks about us, how he views us. Here's what I just want to tell you today. And you're listening to this podcast right now because you want to grow. You have other things you, sh you could be doing 
but you're listening to this podcast because you have a desire to grow. And so here's what I would tell you, and here's what I'd challenge you with. God is a good father. This is a truth that we must embrace and, and that we must see God properly. If we're going to experience the fullness of all that God has for us, if we're going to experience the freedom that he desires for us, if we're going to be thriving as children of God, it means that we need to see God properly. And I'm just going to tell you this right now. God is a good father. Uh, Listen, he is, he is righteous. He is holy. He is a judge. But none of that means that he's not extremely good. Jesus um, came to reveal the Father. If you really study the life of Jesus and what he talked about, in fact, he said, he said, listen, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Jesus came to reveal the Father. Jesus came to reveal the heart of the Father. So many people misunderstand the Father. So many people misunderstand God as a Father. They think he's just kind of angry. They think he's disappointed. They think he just wants to punish people. They kind of have this, you know, view. Even in the Old Testament, people want to bring up Old Testament stuff. Well, God was just angry in the Old Testament, and in the New Testament, he's just kinder now. No, even in the Old Testament, Moses and and, and different people, the way they would describe God, the way that God would describe himself, he was gentle, and he was kind, and he was patient, and he was generous. This is God as a father in our life. And if I view God as anything other than a good father, I am going to interact and engage with him improperly. When I know that he's a good father, here would be what I would say. If I think that God is angry and just looking to punish me, if, 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 if my view of God is distorted and I think, well, he's a father, he's just not good. He's a father, he's just not kind and gentle and compassionate and gracious and long, you know, long-suffering. And he, he's, he's really just, he's got a short temper, he's angry, and uh, he just wants to punish me. I believe this as a kid. I remember you know, doing something bad as a kid and immediately thinking, well... The hammer, like I remember thinking, God's going to punish me now. Hammer's going to come down on me. I just had no concept of God as a really good father. And when I when I see him as angry, when I see him as just wanting to punish me, I run from him, not run to him. Uh, God invites us to come to him, even in the midst of our sin, even in the midst of our frailty. Even in the midst of our brokenness, he wants us to come to him, not go away from him. But when I believe he's just angry, well, I sinned. God's probably pissed off now. He's just going to punish me. When that's my view of God, I pull away from him rather than move towards him. If I think he's just disappointed in me all the time, then, then, then that's all of a sudden when I begin to believe that shame keeps me away from God. If I believe God is just angry and just disappointed in me, th- this is what the enemy does. He, he, he lies to us. We get tripped up in sin or we don't do something right. And, and the enemy comes and goes. He lies to us about God as a father. He puts shame on us. And now that shame, rather than coming to the father and really hearing what he has to say about us, Shame keeps us hidden. Shame, keep, shame keeps us in a corner. We just believe God has disappointed us, and we're ashamed, and we're afraid of punishment. But Jesus came, and he said, no, God is gentle, and he is patient, and he is forgiving. Is he righteous? Is he holy? Yes. But he is gentle, and he is patient, and he is kind, and he is forgiving. And we saw Jesus with this. When Jesus responded to uh, the woman with the issue of blood, when Jesus responded to the woman caught in adultery, when Je- even the kindness, even when, when Jesus would, would be, you know, he would be direct with Peter, 
you know, Peter, stop talking like that. Satan, get behind me. But the gentleness that he showed Peter after Peter denied him, after Peter, who had walked with him, had been in the trenches with him for three years, that when the moment came, Peter didn't even have the fortitude enough to stand with his friend and his Savior and his Lord. Instead, he denied Jesus, and Jesus wasn't harsh on him. Jesus was so gentle with him on the beach. And and so Jesus comes and reveals the heart of the Father because he's inviting us, listen, don't see God as anything other than a really good Father. But here's the other thing, and this is an illustration I've used, is that if you believe, so, so one, how I see God determines how I interact with him. If I see him as angry and disappointed and wanting to punish me, then I engage with him from a distance. I pull back. If I see him as a good father who is loving and generous and kind and patient, then I move towards him. But the other lie is this, is how do I view God? What is my belief about how God sees me? If I think God is just looking at me disappointed all the time, if I think God's just looking at me and he's just disappointed, he's critical, he's just looking to punish me all the time, then, then how it affects me experiencing the fullness of what God has for me. Listen, this is what sociologists know, is that sociologists, uh, so Charles Cooley, uh, who's considered the dean of sociology, I, I've talked about him quite a bit in this illustration, but he was, I think he was around the early 1900s. He came up with a concept called the looking glass self, the looking glass self concept. And the looking glass self concept just says that how we view ourselves, our self-esteem, our perception of ourselves isn't as much dependent on what we believe about ourselves, but what we believe the most important person in our life believes about us. So how I view myself isn't really dependent on how I see myself, but on what I believe the most important person in my life sees about me. Uh, the illustration is, is that moms are really good at this. You know, uh, uh, I remember Tony Campolo uh, using this illustration one time that, you know, he, he, said, he said he had a friend that would, could flunk a class and he would come home and his mom would say, it just shows you they don't know how to educate a genius at that school. Like the kid just flunked a class but his mom is convinced he's a genius. And, and somehow she turns around an F in a class to still prove that her baby boy, her son is a genius. And all that F proves is they don't know how to educate a genius down there at that school. Well, when that's the voice in your life, when your mom is the most important person in your life as a kid, and your mom's constantly telling you that you're a genius, what do you think you're going to believe about yourself? you're going to believe you're a genius because the most important person in your life believes that about you. So when God who takes preeminence in our life, when God who is the number one spot in our life, when I believe he's just constantly disappointed in me, when I believe that he's just angry with me all the time, when I believe that he's just critical about me, then what about, how am I going to view myself but when I can really, when I understand properly how he sees me, when I understand properly how he views me, when I understand properly the value that he has for me, the love that he has for me, it changes everything in my life. So many times with people, I'm just like, what you need to really encounter is what God really thinks about you. You think God thinks this about you, and it's affecting your life. If you really just understood what God thought about you, if you really understood how God viewed you. That's why it's so important to understand what, how Jesus views us. I, uh, this is the other thing, because, I mean, following Jesus is radical. I, I mean, following Jesus, it, it, like really following God requires radical obedience. But when, when we view God as something other than a good father, then the sacrifice and inconvenience and obedience that's required to follow him is hard for us. In other words, when I don't believe that God really has my best intentions in mind, 
When I believe that God isn't good, when I believe that he doesn't have my highest in his heart, God is not hidden about his intentions with us. Can I just say this? I don't know if you ever talk to somebody and you're talking to them the whole entire time. You're like, it feels like there's some hidden agenda right now. Like you want to sell me something or, 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 or you're trying to get some angle with me and I can't quite figure out what your agenda is or what your intentions are. God is not hidden with his intentions and he's not hidden with his agenda with you. You know what God's agenda with you is? Freedom. You know why he sent his only son to die on a cross for you? So that you could experience freedom here in this life and for eternity. And you know what else he wants for you? Abundant life. He wants you to have life and life more abundant. He wants you to be thriving. He wants you to experience the fullness of all that he is. So God's agenda for you is not hidden. It is a thriving, abundant life of freedom. Now, if I don't believe that, if I don't believe that all of God's commands in my life, if I don't believe that everything God is asking of me is simply so that I can be free, that what he's asking me to give up, what he's asking me to sacrifice, what he's asking me to risk, what he's asking me to lay down, if I don't believe that everything he asks of me is because he is a good father who has my best interests in mind, that his highest agenda for me is that I would experience freedom. And he knows in order to experience freedom, you can't be entangled in sin. In order to experience freedom, you have to trust him. And so if I know that he's a really good father, then it makes radically obeying him a lot easier. But I'm telling you, the, the enemy comes in and he'll be like, is God really good? Does he really have your best in mind? Can you really trust him? And he begins to sow seeds of doubt so all of a sudden we don't really fully embrace, we don't move towards God with radical obedience. We don't move towards God when we have shame in our lives. We don't move towards God when we, we've tripped up and we've sinned. Or we, we don't really actually b believe that he sees us as his kids that he loves. Here would be, we've said a lot in the last 20 minutes or whatever, but this, this, would, this is honestly, if I, could just wrap, if I could wrap the whole thing up, it would just be this. The enemy is trying to distort your view of God, and he's trying to distort what you believe, how you believe God views you. And, and, and God is a really good father. He's not angry with you. He's not disappointed in you. He's not just looking to punish you all the time. He is kind and gracious and compassionate and loving. And even everything he calls us to, and he does call us to radical obedience. He does call us to separate from sin. He does absolutely challenge any area in our life that would lead us to bondage rather than freedom. So he does challenge us about sin. And he does ask us to trust him. And he does call us to a life of radical obedience. But all of that is because he is a good father who has your best in mind. And then your life would live, you, you'd be so much more confident if you really just understood how he viewed you. So here, here's, here's what I'd encourage you to do. The Bible says, taste and see that the Lord is good. I would encourage you. If you, if you stop and just say, you know what, I think I have a distorted view of who, the God, who God is as a good father. And I think I have a distorted view of how God views me. Get in the word of God and then get into his presence. Taste and see through his presence and through his word. Allow God to reveal to you who he is as a good father and what he believes about you as his child.